Hey everybody, it's Paul Yeager. Welcome inside the MTOM Show Podcast Studio. I'm Paul Yeager, your host. If you want to send me an email, paul.yeager at iowapbs.org. We do get tips. Thank you, Russ. Always appreciate hearing from you. And if you have comments, send them my way. Or if you want to rate or leave comments wherever you get your podcasts. Cool with that. Every Tuesday, new episodes come out of this conversation themed podcast. That's what we do. We talk with producers from around the globe. We're going to Washington State today. We're going to talk to Nicole Berg. She's currently the president of the National Weed Association. It is a policy arm that discusses policy. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to discuss a little bit of policy. Nicole was actually on Market to Market without her even knowing. She was testifying in Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago. That's how we found out about her. So we learn more about her operation and the family that uh, is involved with growing wheat and corn in Washington State. That's what we're going to talk about this week on the MTOM Show podcast. All right, Nicole, if I had to look out your window right now and see, is there anything green and growing around you? Or are you just like everyone else in the West, all dry? Um, we definitely are dry. We're coming out, out of a drought, um, but we did have some some grateful rain this spring. And then we had some rain just in the last week or so. So things are kind of greening up in, in the dry land area. Um, I do have irrigated as well. So the bluegrass seed that we grow is um, up and ready to go for next year. So yeah, we're trying to wrap up planting and then wrapping up field corn harvest here at the farm. What exact part of the state are you in? So I am in South Central Washington State. Okay. I, I'm like down by the Columbia River. So we have an irrigated farm, which are, we get the majority of our water from the Columbia River. Is this a home for you? Is this where you grew up? It is where I grew up. I'm a fourth generation farmer. My grandpa, he came out West in, in, in 1934. We just looked that up. And I always wonder, how, was he sleeping on the train when he came out here? Because it's very sandy. Um, we have about six inches of rainfall a year in the dry land area. That's why we kind of converted part of the farm into the into the irrigated agriculture, which gives us a little bit more options um, in farming practices. So you're fourth can, generation, you said. Mm -hmm, I'm fourth generation. I farm here with my dad and my two brothers. Um, right now, I came back to the farm in 97. Um, me, my two brothers came back to, to kind of convert it into from dryland wheat. It went back in the day with sheep, and then it went cattle. Then it went wheat, and now we're irrigated agriculture. So dad, my dad always says, the most I've ever seen in farming was not like ever done in farming or, or progressed progression of farming it was not really my grandpa, great grandpa, my grandpa, but it's, it's your generation. Your generation is the one that has really changed the conversation of farming. Why did you change? Uh, well, it's so to be productive. I mean, we have to stay productive, progressive. Um, you know, I mean, the thought of using a computer to to drive your tractor alone. My grandpa would come in and like hit hit the thing with the, his cane and say, "Hey, this thing's not driving right. You're not eating enough dirt." <laughs> so, you know, I mean, we have made a lot of strides in agriculture and technologies, and and so our farm has tried to stay progressive with that as well. You said 97s when you came back. Did you think before 97 that you would be on the farm? No. <laughs> I went to Washington State University, got a degree in agricultural communications. And actually, Paul, I wanted to be you. <laughs> so <laughs> back in the day. And then I worked in the uh, wine industry for a while. And then I came back to the farm when they decided to develop it and kind of take it to a next level. And so I wanted to be part of the, part of the team to do that. And did your brothers come back at the same time? Yes, we're all two years apart. So um, me and my um, second youngest um, came back. And then the, the youngest youngest, once he graduated from college, he went and worked out um, in for Novartis back in the day in Texas. And then he came back to the farm. But dad made us all go to college. And then we all, at, at, <laughs> he's like, uh, you're all going to work out in the real world for a while and then decide if you want to come back. And so we said, okay, dad, that's what I'll do. And so I, I worked out in the real world and now I'm back here at the farm. Was there ever a moment when you were like, yeah, I'm not coming back? Um, 
well, yeah, when you're in high school, you're like, oh my God, there's a big world out there. I got to go do other things. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of things I could do. And so, yeah, I mean, when you graduate from college, you would think you're going to start as CEO of some company or something. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that's just that young kind of inspiring, this is what I'm going to do. And then you kind of get out in the real world and you're like, hmm, hmm this is kind of interesting. And so, um, it was nice to have the opportunity that dad gave us to kind of spread our wings ourselves and kind of to c convert from dryland agriculture to irrigated agriculture. And so he said that it was something that he feels his dad never gave him the opportunity. And he wanted to give the three of us an opportunity to really grow the farm and not just sit in, in this, in this area of, Hey, this is what grandpa did. This is what we're going to do. And so he wanted us to kind of fly, be, go out there, do some things. Right. It's the, and I've heard that as CEOs of companies where, you know, if it's a family owned, like you have to go work somewhere else before you come back. We want you to see how other places do it. So you're not just one way of, of doing it. Uh, when you have come back and you mentioned irrigated and non-irrigated water has become, do you remember water being as big of an issue when you were younger? No. No, 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 no. Yeah. I mean, like I saw neighboring farms develop out into irrigated agriculture and it wasn't that big of an issue. And when we came back and started to converting to irrigated agriculture, it took us about five, six years to get it done. And that was like right when the door was closing with the Endangered Species Act on the Columbia River. And so it, we, you know, I never thought the journey would be that hard and, and it was hard, but I also understand preserving natural resources and, um, you don't want to do anything to, to hurt that, but yet we all have to eat. And so, um, to be productive in agriculture and in, in the Columbia basin here, you really need water. Um, and it, and it feeds the world. Where's the water, where do you need snow to fall or rain to fall t that you benefit the most from? Up in Canada, the Columbia River is up in Canada and kind of weaves its way down through um, Washington State. And so up there is where you need the majority of your water from, for the Columbia River. Um, some of it comes from the Yakima River, which is up in the Cascade Mountains. Um, and that all that helps um, the flow of the river. Is there snow yet on any of the those mountains? Uh, yeah, on the uh, uh, Cascade Mountains on uh, Snoqualmie Pass, they've gotten some snow in the last week or so. So. It's kind of like, I didn't think fall was going to get here. And now all of a sudden it's here. And now everybody's freezing. <laughs> so it's kind of cold. Well, uh, here in Iowa, we're pretty dry. You mentioned it's dry there. Uh, what's the, the, the phrase that some of our market analysts like to use? Plant in the dust, your bins will bust. Uh, yeah, or we is dusted in, bust the bin. <laughs> yeah, so it, that's optimistic wheat talk as well. Absolutely. In the, in the Plains area, I'm hearing horror stories, Oklahoma, Kansas, parts of Texas, um, Nebraska, all those, those folks that we represent, you know, you, you're hearing horror stories where my horror stories were two years ago when I only harvested a third of the farm um, of dryland wheat. So I, my heart goes out to everybody who's in a drought situation because it's tough. It's tough farming and it, and it, it becomes very, daunting when you don't see your plants jump out of the ground and they curl up and go back in. I have talking to a farmer in Texas this last, um, last year um, cycle, and he didn't even uh, harvest. It didn't even come out of the ground. And I, I mean, I just, you know, I, I get it. <laughs> I have pictures of the same, the same kind of concept. I am in the driest area in the world that grows cereal grains uh, behind a place in Israel with the six inches of rain a year. And so, yeah, I was like, that's why I said grandpa must have been asleep when he went through Iowa or even through the, the dark dirt in North Dakota. He was a sleeper. Maybe he couldn't get to the door quick enough and somebody else yeah, beat him maybe. out. Maybe. I don't you know. know. He, he landed the in the stand, dude. <laughs> yeah. He needed to get off before. He didn't want to go be a fisherman and get off at the ocean. So he had That's to stop. right. Yeah. A couple exactly. more hours on the train, he would have been there. He, you would have, we'd be talking about Alaskan Chinook or, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the salmon or something. Yeah. Uh, when, when you say it's dry in areas, what does dry consecutive years mean for the overall health of U.S. wheat? Well, dry consecutive years means that we, you know, we, we grow healthy, safe food for across the world. And if we can't grow the wheat and we can't have the food, and so it does mean uh, supply issues for our customers. 50% of the wheat 
uh, goes overseas um, to customers. And so I think that that's something really important to, to always come back and think we feed the world. And so that's kind of what it, what it prevails. The other thing that happens to actually as farmers is we have to utilize the safety net of the farm bill. Um, the crop insurance will keep us in business. It will pay some bills and that's about it. You don't make money off of crop insurance. Just to um, keep the doors you, open. That's right. All it does is keep the doors open and you can pay your fertilizer bill and you can pay your bills. Well, not so much this year with the high input costs, but, but you know, you do, you try to pay your bills and, and try to keep the, the family farm functioning. Well, how we found you was you were testifying in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, here a couple of months ago. How, uh, how did you get selected to, to go sit on one of those panels? So we were selected. The wheat industry was asked because of the conservation practices that we utilize across the country. Uh, we are a very cons conservation-oriented planning kind of system, I would call it, and it's very unique. And so they wanted to know our thoughts on the Title II programs, as well as the conservation practices that we utilize. I ut personally utilize the Conservation Reserve Program on the farm, um, which kind of gives you that, that strip till kind of feel, um, for lack of a better word, for folks. Um, and it helps you know, with the productive areas and then the non-productive areas of the farm and the environmentally sensitive areas of the farm. And so we definitely are a true proponent of voluntary incentive-based programs. And I think they saw some of it was my passion for um, the conservation programs, as well as, you know, I, I know what it can do to help the farming practices and the business plan of our farm. So how did you I, get to be so passionate about it? Um, I think part of it was uh, I was involved in the conservation district world for a while. Um, I did get the Olin Sims Award. It's actually right there. <laughs> um from the conservation districts, which was a national um, award. And I've just always been passionate about, there has to be a balance in farming. And I think some of it there is, and I think that us farmers are true environmentalists in, in some aspects or conservationists, whichever your definition is. And I think that the whole problem we have is that we just need to tell our story better. I think we, you know, we implement these new practices. We, you know, we have direct seed. We have now drills that will seed in certain spots and not in certain spots. We have sprayers that, you know, will only spray a certain certain spot where there's weed and won't spray the rest of the ground. You know, all of those things are conservation oriented, and and so us farmers through Title II programs really helps us tell that story. Well, is that something that your father, grandfather were into, or was it, you went to a meeting one night and you were inspired? Uh, well, my dad was on the conservation district board as well. And my, and I believe my great grandpa was too. And I'm not sure my grandpa was, he was, he was kind of political, but did more of the cat. He was more of the cattle and the sheep. Um, and so, yeah, I just, you know, I've always, I had a passion for it. And so I think it's something that's important. And, and like I said, all us farmers really are you have to take care of your ground or you're not going to grow anything. Well, and there's always a fight, uh, I, I think, sometimes among generations or even those in the same operation that we need to do this. No, we can't. It doesn't pencil out. And then you say, uh, no, we can't afford not to because we need to have the land two years, 20 years down the road. How's that internal debate been among the family? I think it's been great with our family. We're pretty progressive um, folks, all of us, and we are kind of gadget oriented. <laughs> and so like my one brother, he does all the irrigation water management and all the pivots now turn on and off, you know, through the computer, you watch them water through the computer. You can even do variable rate water in certain, in certain circles where you only, you know, water one area, not the other. And then you just start running the numbers and the numbers will tell you if you do it or not do it. And the majority of the time, the numbers come out saying, hey, just the overlap with GPS and I can save fertilizer, that was worth it. Plus the voluntary incentive-based programs on top of that did help put more of a carrot, you know, for us to kind of get motivated to go out there and go do it. Like direct seed, um, our wheat, uh, dryland wheat is direct seed. Now, would we have bought the $180,000 drill without like CSP? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that would have penciled out, but we did the CSP program 
did the direct seed, and now we've implemented into our into our practices. And so um, now we're looking for the next direct seed drill. You know, like you're, you you kind of like you get that 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 technology, and then you kind of keep moving it forward. And in so my nephews just came back to the farm. They just graduated from Washington State, and so it's it's always fun to see their. Um, they pick up the auto steer a lot faster than Auntie Cole does. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so how did Auntie Cole get involved in National Wheat? How did that happen? So it was when I was, we were developing the farm and I needed a little bit of political help with my section 10 404 to, to actually pull water out of the river. Realizing that as well as when we, we had this dry land farm and I started looking at the balance sheet and I'm like, holy smokes, you know, through C CRP, through my, my um, price support payments, and you know like crop insurance and all that stuff i the government really is involved in farming i mean whether we like it or not it is and so i wanted to have a say i mean i wanted to help make sure a family farm stay in business and so i got on the state board i was on the state board for five years and then i went to the conservation districts then was asked to come back and go through the chairs and so then i went through the chairs at the state level and then I was asked to kind of stick around, you know, and let's let's get some new energy into the process of of where we're going with the association. And so that's when I decided, yeah, I can be the second woman ever. <laughs> Why not? To be to be what on the board or to be president? <laughs> to be president. There's only been one other woman before me that was president of the association, and she was from Washington State. Do you know who that person is? Oh yeah, it's Judy Olson. Um, is her name? And she farms um, north east of me. And then she also went on to work for Patty Murray, uh, Senator Murray's office for many years after that, and then became an FSA director. And so, yeah, she was very well um, uh, accepted and just kind of paved the way. And when I was thinking about doing it, she actually came up to me at a convention and said, you're doing this. <laughs> You'll be one of the greatest things that you've ever done. And it's, it's a great experience. And you just meet so many mm -hmm. great people and farmers across the country, which that's been my favorite part is meeting like my friends in Kansas or Minnesota or, you know, just across the country, Texas. It's just fun to see the different cultures. And I'm not afraid to ask the question, hey, are you using this kind of implement or this implement? Because we all farm different. I mean, yeah. it's all different. And so you, you don't you're not really even scared to ask the question because it's, it's just all different across the country. So. You uh, so as president of National Wheat Association, what does that exactly mean? So as president, it's a year term, um, and so I oversee a board of um, twenty-one states. Our board of directors actually is kind of a Senate kind of comp comp compilation of um, growers across the U.S. And so we have meetings. Um, all like during the whole year. And then we talk policy. Um, we're Congress. We are the Congress arm of the wheat industry as, as with regard to policy, policy. And then our big, big, you know, goal is the next farm bill, which expires in 2023. And so that's been our focus. Our main focus right now is like, how are we going to get this farm bill done? Are we going to get it extended? Are we going to have a new one? You know, I mean, I think we'll know a lot more next week. Uh, to see exactly where things go. Well, this this our conversation comes out on election day. So by the time many people consume this, we may know <laughs> or we've got we're going to vote right now. So I'm not going to ask you necessarily if this party wins or the other, but uh you had to if you already had to start and have started those conversations to Absolutely. help because staff will stay the same even if the office holder may be different or you need to kind of keep things moving and in front of mind because you can't just wait right until it's like a month before this thing expires. It's a big, Oh no, 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 no. You can't just wait. We, we have been, uh, this spring, we did some priority listings and then we also wrote a letter, um, to the four corners, um, to kind of laying out our priorities of where we think, you know, these are some of our priorities where we like to go with them. They were kind of high level because we, we kind of, we haven't had a chance as an industry to kind of, nail it down, which we'll, we'll start maybe doing next week in our meetings. Um, and then we did a fly-in in September. And so we hit over 55 offices and we had about 20 different members show up to try to hit all these different offices that we needed to meet. 
I personally met with the House Ag Committee and the Senate Ag Committee. Um, and so, yeah, you have to keep those conversations going. It, it, you know, I always said that one of the best things that happened in the last farm bill was what the Senate did, that bipartisan bill they made. I mean, how many, I mean, that had to been historic with how many votes were Democrat and how many were Republican. And I truly believe the farm bill should be a bipartisan bill that helps farmers and helps us all have safe, healthy food. And so with that, I think it should be bipartisan. Uh, we had the episode before this was with a uh, uh, University of Illinois person who used to work in staff work in D.C. And we talked about the farm bill and he said the House is much more political when it comes to this bill. And historically, the farm bill has been overwhelmingly food and the rest is conservation. I mean, we're talking food assistance. Um, that's part of the coalition that happens is do you see that that is going to stay that way for the foreseeable future that it's still heavy on food assistance and the rest is what we would call what happens and helps to for people like you in the in the middle of farming i think it, i think because of food stamps and the the assistant programs that are in the farm bill and the uh, level of um, funding that it has I, I don't necessarily see them splitting. I, I don't hope they don't split because we need a, a bipartisan bill over over 500 offices. And there are, as you and I both know, not all offices are rural and there's a lot of urban offices. And so we have to be able to keep that conversation going with those urban offices. And they have a tendency to be a little bit, they'll have more of a conversation with you because of the nutrition part of the bill. And so I don't necessarily see it separating, um, but good goodness, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball like that either for Congress. <laughs> so <laughs> you kind of never be, know. <laughs> we'd be doing something else, Nicole, if that was I the know. case, right? Exactly. I would not be sitting here. I would be on a desert <laughs> island somewhere. <laughs> uh, the desert islands. Um that kind of bridges to one of the last things I want to discuss with you is the islands of wheat production around the world and what can happen when one person decides I want to take advantage of someone else. Um, Russia has had a huge thumb on wheat in the last, well, since February. Mm -hmm. Is that good for the industry when one, it really is one person having that much influence on what it is you are doing in Washington state and your rest of your growers across the country? Well, I think that, as you know, it's been a roller coaster ride, and most people get nauseous on roller coaster rides. And so that's kind of how I viewed it. Um, I, I feel bad for the folks like in Africa, because I have been to Africa and seen the famine in Africa, and they're heavily reliant on wheat from the Black Sea area. And so it, it is very unfortunate that the Black Sea and, and those folks, you know, possibly could be having more food security problems than they, I mean, they already had food security problems, so they have to have even more food security problems. So yeah, it, it's it's like the roller coaster ride of, of pricing um, inputs. Um, it's really put us farmers um, really having to keep our pencil sharp to try to make sure we can farm the next year because of the volatility. Um, I don't think anybody likes volatility. It makes your stomach go funny, just like the roller coaster. It makes your stomach go, but there's some who, who necessarily, their computer algorithms thrive on it. Yes, this is true. <laughs> and, but it makes those who don't uh, trade necessarily with the computer, yes, your stomach is funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Do you mm -hmm. see a case where wheat is, is it ever going to go back to not being such a global commodity than maybe... Um, I mean, it's always kind of been global, but do you ever see a day when it comes to not be so global? I think it will always be global um, just because of the food dependency for protein in the majority of the world and just their dietary um, needs that they have through their cultures. I see it will always be a global, global market. Yeah, it doesn't go away. No, no, no. It would. I mean, you'd have to really change some cultures. Um, because of the protein and the food dependency that some of those cultures have with, with protein. And I mean, doesn't everybody like wheat? <laughs> <laughs> the, 
there's those who love to grow it. Yeah, and that's uh, right. but, but there's also been some in some areas, Nicole, that have switched acres from wheat to something else. How does wheat stay competitive in the United States with farmers to make sure they keep growing the product? Or if they wander a little bit, is it okay? I think a farmer's going to do what a farmer's going to do to stay in business. I think that they're going to grow what they think they can grow to, to that they can grow the best and make enough money to stay in business that next year and to the, probably the next generation. Um, I think that that's the, that's the thought process of, of a farmer. Um, the wheat industry, yes, um, acreages have been declining down, but it's all dollars and cents. Um, we do grow the safest, you know, healthiest food in the world. And so I think that does definitely keep us competitive, especially like in the like Pacific Northwest, we grow a soft white wheat. 90% of the wheat goes overseas. Um, so, you know, it's profitable for us to, to do that. Now, five, $5 wheat, it's not profitable. So you understand why a farmer is, is turning the corner and, and moving into different areas. There are areas across the state, though, wheat that's kind of all you grow i mean you have a few other options but not a lot of other options and so it's a lot different than the midwest um like from where you're from from the corn and soy belt um whereas it's like in my area you there's not many other options but wheat to grow well uh you mentioned two things uh of, of, of interest uh, to me, what you just said. Uh, here we're dealing with uh, the farmers around the Mississippi are dealing with a low water flow issue. We had a discussion on, on the TV show last week about is the Pacific Northwest going to be a more viable port for some who are west of a certain point and start shipping it? But then it becomes to, to be a competitive thing for that rail What's going to get on the rail to end up? What And is there enough capacity in the ports of Seattle and wherever that something's headed east? Is there enough capacity out there? They always say yes. <laughs> of course, the railroad is always like we talk about the Snake River dams in our area and, you know, kind of that whole kerfuffle with um, the barges here. And so I can relate it to here that, you know, you always hear stories that, yeah, there's enough rail. There isn't enough this, but is there, you know, kind of thing. And so those are great questions. The Mississippi with 1,800 barges stuck, basically. It, it's, it's a sad story. And, and historical lows of water, they are dredging, which is great um, to hopefully get the, the water flowing. But, yeah, I mean, you everybody sits back and says, oh, yeah, you know, it can go this way or it can go this way, you know, kind of thing. And so um, I always say, though, the grain will get to where it needs to go. Now, it may take a little bit longer sometimes, but it usually gets to where it needs to go. And it may cost a little more to, to ship it. And that's very unfortunate because the farmer always pays for that. Right. Uh, what's your basis level been like on your wheat uh, that you've been trying to sell here in the last, we'll just say, three months? Um, you know what? I haven't even checked lately. <laughs> well, and that's, <laughs> but I mean, it's a matter of, because I, I like to say all basis is like politics. It's all local. I sure. mean, basis, it, it's hugely dependent on where you're at. And I just didn't know with this influx what that's done to you. Yeah. No, I haven't even looked. And my brother does a lot of that marketing. He used to work in the green marketing part. So he tracks it a little bit closer than I do. I track it, but I kind of work more on the policy side and yeah. CRP and stuff like that. So well, let's, we have let's, to have our little areas. Of, that's right. You, you do. here. And it's you good. were here. Yeah. <laughs> I probably should have looked it up before I, you, you, uh, I, I had the interview. I usually do. That's okay. Uh, Nicole, let's close with this. As we wrap up 2022 and flip the calendar to 2023, what is going to be the three biggest stories that the wheat industry is, that we need to pay attention to impacting wheat? The biggest story I think right now is going to be the railroad. I think that that's going to be with, with two unions um, voting not to accept the tentative agreement. I think that that's going to cause some problems in the industry and big bottlenecks uh, across the country. So that's one of them. Um, I see the Ukraine-Russia issue with regard to supply and demand. Still going to keep it very volatile. Um, like you said, it's, it's stuff out of our control by somebody who's 
who's trying to impact a certain region of the world. Um, I see that as it's just going to keep the roller coaster ride going as far as it, the, uh, the price as well as input. Um, and then the third one, um, we are just going to work diligently on that 2023 farm bill renewal. Uh, we have to get an extension or we need to get a new farm bill. And whether it's, it's, it's got to be one or the other. <laughs> so those are the three I kind of see as yeah. big issues that are going to be faced in the weed industry right now. Got a lot to do in 2023. There's no, uh, no downtime for you. No, no downtime. Yeah. And then I, I will, uh, in March, I turn over to the, the vice president. And so then it's his problem, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But for some reason I get the sneaking suspicion. You won't, uh, you can't quite quit it even if you're uh, not in that one position. Oh yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. You can, all farmers, I've always told everybody, all farmers need to get out there, talk to your legislators. It is so important to you get off the farm every once in a while and tell your story. Everybody has to tell their story because it's, I mean, it, it's the only way we're going to get a new farm bill or get an extension. Mm-hmm. And we appreciate you telling us your story. Thank you, Nicole. Well, thank you, Paul. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. That's Nicole Berg. She's uh, president right now of the National Weed Association joining us today from Washington State. My thanks to Nicole Berg. Appreciate the time and appreciate you making it this far in the podcast. If you have any feedback for the podcast as a whole or the show, market to market at iowapbs.org is the email address to use. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching.